Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to the High Energy Seminar in 2016. And our seminar covers a very diverse topic in astrophysics, given by uh, speakers from both uh, other institutes and uh, our local astrophysicists. And once in a while, we are also going to have Stephen Mayer's lectures, and given by very prestigious speakers. And today, um, our first speaker this year is um, Dr. Dale Kosvisky. And Dale is an assistant professor at uh, Cal B College. And he got his PhD degree in um, University of Hawaii in 2006. After that, he has been postdocs at UC Davis and UC St. Cruz. And uh, he has been an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky um, for two years before he moving to um, Calv. And uh, um, Dr. Kowski is an uh, uh, expert on uh, aging feedbacks, especially on their relations with the host uh, um, galaxy. And All right, thanks. All right. Uh, Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, yes, indeed. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some of my work studying the uh, Adrian Galaxy connection, and, uh, and particularly um, what we're learning about um, the connection with the host galaxy, the demographics of Adrian host galaxies from uh, the CANDLES survey. Uh, so for those of you unfamiliar with CANDLES, CANDLES is this Hubble um, Wide Field Camera 3 survey of, of galaxies at redshifts of two. So essentially it's the uh, the first large-scale study of galaxy properties out at Redshift of 2 when um, basically the star formation activity of the universe was at its peak, and, and more importantly from my perspective, when the uh, black hole growth of the universe was at its peak, when nuclear activity was at its peak. Um, just uh, uh, a quick reminder, um, CANDLES, by the way, stands for the Cosmic Assembly Near for a Deep Astrologic Legacy Survey. It's one of these great acronyms where we liked the acronym we needed, or we liked the name, we needed an acronym to fit the, fit the name. So, um, But uh, what's really unique about CANDLES is that, or I guess I should say with the, the power of CANDLES, is that with uh, the high-resolution WIFC-3 imaging from CANDLES, it, it, um, it provides us um, a uh, high-resolution look at the rest frame optical properties of galaxies at redshifts of two for a large sample of galaxies, really for the first time. So this um, galaxy here is a uh, massive AGN host at a redshift of 1.55, and the two first um, images here are the previous uh, ACS uh, uh, V and Z band um, images. And basically, we're probing rest frame UV, and you can see essentially that you'd be hard pressed to tell what the morphology of this galaxy is. Uh, but as you probe out to uh, longer wavelengths, so uh, the observed near infrared or the rest frame optical at redshifts of two, um, we basically start to see that a disk appears. You can see a bulge in the center, maybe uh, a companion or a knot of star formation off to the side. So, um, so the SWIFT C3 imaging really allows us to get at the morphology, in many cases, allows us to understand the morphology for the first time since even really massive bright galaxies tend to drop out in these ACS bands um, in our previous imaging. Um, so Kansas turns out to be a, um, a great data set to study the Aegean galaxy connection because uh, it's imaged uh, five fields in total. Four of them have, are among the deepest uh, X-ray observations that exist. So uh, we've observed Good South and Good North, which have the CDF South and North, of course. Uh, uh, the Cosmos field, uh, so we've uh, imaged a, a subsection of Cosmos. And then the EGS field, which has a, a, the 800 kilosecond um, um, the Chandra observations. And uh, our fifth field is the UDS field, and I'll get back to that near the end of the talk, and UDS is, uh, has just become, we've basically just filled out our X-ray observations for the fifth field. So we now have deep uh, and, and sometimes relatively wide X-ray observations over all five of the candles uh, fields. So um, what I'll be talking about today is uh, really trying to address two questions. Uh, the first is what triggers AGN activity at redshift of sub two? Uh, simulations and, and fueling models tell us that mergers should be the dominant mechanism that are driving black hole growth at, at these redshifts. And so this is one of the first things we wanted to test was if we actually study the, uh, if we actually pick out these um, uh, AGN in our, sample, in our survey fields, do we find any evidence linking them to an increased incidence of merger activity? And the second question is, what role do AGN play in um, quenching the first generation of passive galaxies that appear at redshift of two. So it's really at this redshift that massive uh, um, passive galaxies start to appear on the red sequence in large numbers. And so um, if 
we think AGN feedback plays some role in this. Do we find any evidence that AGN are in uh, galaxies that are transitioning onto the red sequence at these epochs? So let's start with the, the first question, what triggers AGN activity? So uh, a few years ago, we had a study where we went out, we selected in the Good South field, we selected out uh, about 150 X-ray selected AGN at a redshift between 1.5 and 2.5. And we did, uh, we basically visually classified their morphology. So we had about 20 people take a look at each of these sources. And then we did the same thing for a mass matched sample of inactive galaxies. And um, so the, the top panel here shows an example of what some of these things look like. So the, uh, the top set are uh, the H-band uh, with C3 images. Uh, you can see a couple examples of spheroids, some disks, uh, some cl uh, clear interactions and mergers. Here's two galaxies where you can see some tidal features. Um, they're clearly interacting. And the bottom panel shows essentially what the ACS imaging of these systems looked like in the past. Uh, essentially, again, even though these systems are uh, relatively massive uh, and relatively bright, uh, many of them completely drop out in the ACS imaging. So we really need the WIPC3 imaging here. Um, and what we find is that, consistent with previous results, is that there really isn't a significant difference between the AGM population and the quiescent population. So this pi uh, plot shows the fraction of galaxies with a, uh, with a particular morphology. Uh, uh, and you can see these listed down here, disks, spheroid, uh, things that are classified as mergers, things classified as disturbed. And you can see that there's a lot going on here, but I'll focus your eye to this one. Uh, for galaxies that are classified as disturbed, we see that both AGN and control galaxies have roughly the same fraction. So there's no statistical difference, statistically significant difference between the AGN population and the control galaxies. About 50% of uh, both populations are classified as somewhat disturbed. Uh, and in fact, the rest of them are classified as completely undisturbed. In fact, the only difference we see between the two populations is a slight enhancement in the spheroid fraction among the AGN hosts. Um, and so, uh, like I said, this is uh, in agreement with previous results. Several, uh, um, you know, dating back to the ACS surveys, the good surveys, I uh, found exactly the same thing. So this got us thinking, uh, is there a chance that we're missing some of the uh, most disturbed sources? Could it possibly be that there's a connection between obscuration, nuclear obscuration, and these disturbed morphologies? Um, and in fact, hydrodynamical simulations suggest that if the most obscured phase of a galaxy merger should in fact coincide with the uh, stage of the galaxy merger where the, where the morphology is most disturbed. So it could be that we're preferentially selecting out just by using, looking for uh, unobscured AGN, we're basically preferentially picking out galaxies on the, uh, on the two ends of this evolutionary sequence. So we're missing the systems that are most uh, heavily disturbed or uh, obscured uh, and disturbed. So one of the, to test this, um, one of the things we did recently was uh, try to identify systems that, have, uh, that are heavily obscured based on their reflection-dominated X-ray spectra. So uh, perhaps I don't need to explain this to this crowd, but um, you can find, you can indeed find um, heavily obscured competentic sources if you have a reflection component. If you've got, say you've got an obscuring torus and your geometry is just right, and you get X-ray photons scattering off the backside of the torus and into your line of sight, what you end up doing is scattering photons at high energies, basically down to low energies, and you end up getting a soft excess at, at low energies. So here's a uh, uh, basically a regular power law, unobscured AGN spectrum of, a, of a, what you'd expect to find, and this is actually the observed spectrum of a local Compton thick AGN. And you see the soft X-ray spectrum uh, increasing at, at low energies. And so essentially, we use the, the deep X-ray observations in the candles fields to search for these signatures, and so these are three examples in the CDF South, Aegis, and Cosmos, where we see this uptick, where we see the soft excess uh, at low energies, and uh, basically using um, a two-component fit, where we fit the um, intrinsic spectrum and then the scattered component, we can come out with an estimate of the, uh, of the um, uh, neutral hydrogen column density, obscuring column density, an NH value for these, and uh, effectively uh, pick out our, our candidate competentic sources. And so this is from a, a study by Murray Brightman, um, uh, from a couple years ago. And uh, this is the result of that study. This, is, this plot shows the luminosity, uh, the uh, obscuration corrected X-ray luminosity of these sources as a function of redshift. And the color coding is based on our best fit uh, NH values. So the red sources here are uh, basically our, uh, our Compton thick candidates. And so we've essentially compi compiled a sample of about 121 heavily obscured um, AGN, uh, redshift between 0.5 and really about 1.2, so 
Uh, and then uh, a control sample of about 300 moderately obscured AGN and 300 unobscured AGN. Um, and all of these subsamples are matched in redshift and X-ray uh, uh, obscuration corrected X-ray luminosity. And uh, we basically just took a look at the morphologies of these three subsamples. And what we found is quite striking. Uh, the, our obscured sample, our most heavily obscured sample, uh, are tend to be disturbed, they tend to be asymmetric, they tend to be clumpy, so this is what's shown on these panel up here. And then our unobscured sources tend to be uh, extremely smooth. We see some uh, you know, uh, uh, nuclear light uh, poking through, uh, but for the most part, these, there's, they're undisturbed, they're uh, somewhat regular looking. Uh, the panel here shows the fraction of these galaxies with a disturbed or asymmetric morphology as a function of nuclear obscuration. And here, we do now see a statistically significant excess of disturbed morphologies for our most heavily obscured sources in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in this case, the three candles fields that we considered. Um, and so, and again, this is not a luminosity effect. These are at fixed X-ray luminosity. So essentially, the main, the only real difference between these sources is their, uh, is their nuclear obscuration. Um, this panel shows essentially just the, the morphological breakdown of the three samples. Blue here are unobscured sources, green are our obscured ones, and red are our Compton thick candidates. And we see an increase in the disk fraction, decrease in the spheroid fraction, and a, and a statistically significant increase in the disturbed fraction. Or, in fact, if we are more conservative and just look for clear emergers and interactions. We still see this fraction, the overall fraction drops, but we still see a statistically significant increase in the merger, uh, merger rate of these samples. So um, what we think we're finding is, in fact, we've kind of proposed that in this evolutionary sequence, it does appear that we perhaps are catching the early stages of uh, of this, since we have an elevated disk fraction among these sources, but they tend to be disturbed. And so we're uh, arguing that we're perhaps catching an early stage of this evolutionary sequence. And likely, uh, as you for go further along, these systems are uh, so heavily obscured that we're basically missing them, or the covering fraction is starting to get large enough that you don't get those scattered photons coming back uh, and being detected in the, in, by Chandra. Uh, so it could very well be the, that these dust red and quasars that you hear about with WISE may be a, a later evolutionary stage, since those morphologies tend to be more uh, spheroidal uh, in appearance. So in any case, uh, this excess of disturbed morphologies versus obscuration does uh, seem to be consistent with an evolutionary scenario in some sense. Um, so uh, what triggers AJN activity at Rechester 2? Well, uh, we found with candles so far that there's a high disk fraction uh, at Rechester 2, which basically is inconsistent with uh, merger-dominated uh, fueling models. Um, we think we understand why this is, uh, and it has largely to do with gas fractions at Rich Institute, that essentially uh, the high gas fractions leads to uh, secular processes being more important than we previously expected. But that said, we do find heavily ob heavy obscuration uh, is correlated with disturbed morphologies. And so it could very well be that this combination is the, res is the reason why we're not finding a, co a convincing AGN merger connection when you look at uh, the, the ensemble um, AGM, X-ray detected AGM population at, at Redshift of 2. Um, okay, with the last five minutes that I have, let me touch on this uh, second question. What role do AGM play in quenching uh, massive galaxies at Redshift of 2? Well, in this, uh, for this actually, let me start with a little bit of background. One of the things that's really remarkable about passive galaxies at these high redshifts is that they're much more compact than Present, their present-day counterparts. In fact, all galaxies tend to be more compact at, at higher redshifts. This plot shows the effective radius versus redshift for uh, galaxies in the candles fields. Blue here are our star-forming disks, and red here are our, our quenched galaxies. You can see that essentially for, the, for all, uh, both uh, sets of galaxies, the effective radius is decreasing, but it decreases substantially for the passive population. And more importantly, the passive galaxies at redshift to two are significantly more compact than their star forming counterparts, which tells us that we can't simply shut off the star formation of a passive galaxy at redshift to two, or sorry, shut off the star formation of a star forming galaxy at redshift to two and have it passively evolve onto uh, the red sequence. You actually need to s uh, change the structure of the galaxy, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, fortunately, we think we've identified the compact star forming progenitors of these of these so-called red nuggets at Redshift 2. And this is from a paper from Guillermo Barro from a few years ago. 
um, where we've identified star-forming galaxies that have structurally look identical to these passive galaxies. And the only thing that uh, is different, they have the same mass, same um, uh, effective radii, same stellar densities. Uh, the only thing that differentiates them from their star-forming counterparts is that, or their passive counterparts, is that they are still star-forming. Um, to explain where these guys live in parameter space, this is now a U minus V, so just re regular color versus mass plot. It's basically the same as, this, uh, as our, as our uh, 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 color mass cartoon plot. Um, and, and this is in the goods field, and the color coding here is based on the visual classification of the galaxies um, uh, that comes from the candles with C3 imaging. So blue here being disks, and red being the spheroids. Um, we can correct this uh, slope for, you can see the redshift range up here. Um, we can correct this slope for uh, dust, so this is now a dust uh, corrected uh, UMSV color, so the blue cloud flattens out, and we have a red sequence. You can kind of see that there's more orange and red points up here, and a lot more blue points down here. Now, I mentioned that um, you can't simply shut down the star formation of one of these galaxies and have it become a red sequence galaxy, because the morphology, the size of these galaxies, differs than uh, uh, relative to the, the passive galaxies. So one of the things we could do here is incorporate the size of the galaxies in this plot. So now I've divided the mass, which is on the x-axis, by this, the effective radius raised to the 1.5 power. So now the x-axis is essentially a, a pseudo-density, uh, with denser objects over here and more extended objects out here. And now uh, the scale of the points is scaled to the size of the galaxy. The smaller the the point on the plot, the smaller the, the galaxy itself. So we can consider, we can kind of draw a dividing line and say everything to the right of this plot is compact, everything to the left is extended, and then we could draw a, uh, a horizontal line and say everything above this is passively evolving, so essentially the star formation activity is low, and everything below this line is actually star forming. And we think that these passive red nuggets, these really compact red sequence galaxies, live up here, and these are so-called uh, compact star forming progenitors. These, th system, these galaxies have identical structure to these passive galaxies. All we need to do is quench them and they'll move up and become this population. Now in the local universe, these galaxies don't exist. So we know that by redshifts of one, this, this region of this diagram has, has evacuated. These galaxies move off and disappear. Uh, and so we've referred to this as a fast track quenching pathway, that these, uh, at high redshifts, systems become compact, they quench, and then they, by redshifts of one, they disappear. Uh, and then we have a slow track quenching, where these galaxies are extended. We think this is just halo quenching, where basically uh, extended disks are falling into larger halos. They're getting strangulated. Uh, they get, they get their star formation strangulated. Their gas supply um, uh, gets exhausted, and they slowly fade onto the red sequence. Uh, now, I'm mentioning all this because if we go into simulations, this is a simulation from uh, Joel Premack and, and Rachel Somerville, um, uh, if we go into their SAMs and follow the evolutionary pathway of one of these uh, red nugget galaxies, what we, they find is that through a combination of disk instabilities and mergers, these extended star forming galaxies will rapidly uh, become compact. And then when they get to this part of the phase space, it becomes really difficult to get them to stop forming stars and actually quench. They will spend their entire lives sitting down there um, forming stars at a low rate and, and not actually quench. And so what's needed to get them to quench is actually an energy injection. And so this is basically where agent feedback comes in. Uh, in these SAMs, uh, basically, energy will get injected in there, heat the gas up, and these systems, and that's the only way these systems will actually uh, move on to the red sequence. Uh, and so that's basically uh, the argument is that agent feedback is driving that quenching of these red nuggets. Uh, and like I said, the reason I'm mentioning all this is because if we plot up where the AGN live in the good south field, this is what we find. The black point, the black squares are now X-ray selected AGN from the Chandra 4 megasecond data. And what we find is that in this parameter space, we've, the AGN fraction is about 50%. So it's telling us that every other galaxy in this, um, in this, uh, um, in this mass range and this, this pseudo density is hosts an X-ray luminous AGN. Um, it's an extremely high duty cycle. It's basically about 10% in every other part of this uh, region of space. So, um, so very circumstantial evidence, but we're finding that we have, at Redshift of 2, we have a lot of AGN activity precisely where the simulations require energy injection to uh, end up driving these systems to quench. 
Like I said, by redshift of one, these systems are completely gone. These systems uh, evacuate this region of space. So um, effectively, what we're finding is that at masses above 10 to the 10, uh, we find a really large, uh, uh, about 50%, AGN fraction in these compact star-forming galaxies. Um, and so it, at the very least, it tells us the first generation of of quenched galaxies emerged directly following a, rap, uh, a phase of rapid black hole growth. Um, but if we extrapolate a little bit, we can, uh, you know, we can see that there are hints at a possible role of agent feedback in, in actually driving uh, that quenching process. So we're in the process right now of getting uh, um, some follow-up observations, particularly with MOSFET or Keck, uh, to look for signs of large-scale outflows in, in exactly these systems. Um, we have, in fact, stacked by the way, I'll, I'll add, we've stacked the 50% that do not have X-ray detections, and we actually do find a, a significant hard signal. So it could very well be that the other 50% uh, contain uh, heavily obscured uh, um, uh, AGN as well. And so at the moment, we're following up and looking for um, large-scale outflows that could be signs that um, quenching may actually be happening in, the, in these so-called blue nuggets. Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time, but I'll add one uh, quick slide. One of the limitations to both of um, the samples I just spoke about, the Compton thick AGN found through reflection dominated spectra and um, these compact star forming galaxies, one of the two things that they have in common is that they're very rare. Uh, essentially, we have small sample sizes for both. And we're hoping to um, alleviate that problem a little bit with, uh, with our new X-ray observations in the UDS. So this is, uh, um, the, this is the UDS XVP, the uh, survey. Uh, we were, uh, Gunther Hossig and I were awarded about 1.25 uh, uh, megaseconds in the cover of the UDS. This is the fifth candles field that, that so far had lacked uh, Chandra observations. Um, the, the green mosaic here is the WIFC3 uh, mosaic, and uh, essentially uh, you can see the Chandra uh, exposure map outline. And the red, I should say, add just that this red here is the really deep uh, IRAC observations from, from the SEDS uh, uh, survey. Um, so this is actually going to give us an average depth of, about, depth of about 700 kiloseconds in the WIFC3 area. So it's going to be comparable to what we have in EGS. And it's going to nicely fill in uh, this middle part of our, this wedding cake. So if we, if we have uh, you know, the flux versus area covered, green here is, our, is the Cosmos survey. And, and then the CDF South and CDF North pencil beam surveys down here. And so essentially with UDS, we're going to be able to fill in that, that middle layer of the wedding cake. So we'll go relatively deep over a relatively large area and hopefully uh, pick up uh, uh, more of these uh, blue compact soft forming galaxies, as well as these systems where we're seeing this soft excess uh, to add to, this, uh, to, these, uh, to these studies. Okay, so with that, I will throw up my, uh, my summary and just say that um, the two results that we've found just recently is that we, we do find this increase in the disturbance fraction as a function of nuclear obscuration. That's statistically significant, and that's one of the few times that we've actually seen a difference between um, a connection between merger activity and an AGN population. And then we find this, this extremely high fraction of AGN activity in these blue compact star forming galaxies that appear to be uh, in the process of quenching, and so essentially we're finding agent activity right where we need that energy injection to, uh, to turn these galaxies off. Okay, so I'll stop there and, and take your questions. Yeah, so, so that, that's very true. So I think the, the illustrious simulation has showed this, that some of these systems could start small and basically stay small, remain small. Their, their seeds are small. That's right. I think it's really Joel and Avishai that are pushing this idea that all of them have to come from some disk instability phase where clumps migrate to the center, and, and then they, they all start from a larger compact core. So no, that's a very good point. There are simulations that suggest that some of them could actually just start small. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. It, it definitely tells us that the duty cycle is enhanced in those systems. So essentially, they're either on longer or they're, they're flickering on more often. Um, I don't know at the moment how, if, if that can 
constrain w you know, which one of those is actually the right answer. Um, but it does tell us the duty cycle is significantly greater than on an average galaxy, so the aging is on more often. Um, the, the quenching time scale, it's not really clear to me that, that um, you should actually be able to see the AGN at the same time that it's quenching, right? Because simula some simulations suggest that you, know, you can have a 500 million year um, delay between when the AGN is active and when, you, when the, when the blowout phase happens and when you actually see the AGN. So um, I suppose that you can place some constraints on it. I don't have a good sense of what those constraints are at the moment. Yeah. Oh, uh, these guys down here. Yeah. No, actually, for the most part. So this is actually one of the one of the first things we were worried about was that the small sizes for these systems was just coming because you were looking at a nuclear point source. Um, uh, and actually, their their stellar spectra or their their optical spectra just basically look like stellar spectra. They actually don't appear to be dominated by nuclear light in that case. So um, Guillermo Barr has done a lot of MOS fire follow up work where he's measured stellar masses based on uh, velocity dispersions and find that they match fairly well with the SCD uh, derived stellar masses. So it does look like their their spectra, their optical spectra, or near infrared spectra, I should say rest frame optical spectra, um, appear to be stellar dominated. So the X-ray luminosity is like 10 to the 43. They're like 10 to the 43, 10 to the, to 10 to the 44. So they are in the good style. So they're not quasars. They're, they're basically, the area is so small that we're not picking up crazy whopping guys. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so rather different topics. So what I thought I would talk about today was sort of highlights of some of the research that has been going on uh, in the solar and stellar x-ray group of the High Energy Astrophysics Division. Um, and the various uh, research areas, what we, we build instruments, uh, we analyze data from instruments, we also do modeling, and, uh, and simulations. Um, and generally, I've kind of divided it up into sort of coronal magnetic structure, uh, coronal and chromospheric, atmospheric dynamics, solar wind and heliosphere, and then uh, like building things. Um, however, I'm only going to talk about two of these things, uh, things I kind of know more about. And uh, in 20 minutes is not a long period of time anyway, and, and we'll just get bogged down if we get too far. So magnetic structure of the corona, right? So the the corona exists because of the magnetic fields generated in the core of the sun that, produce, that emerge through the photosphere, and they go into the corona. And in order to do things, interesting things in the corona, they have to have currents in them, so they have to be kind of non-potential fields. And they extend into the uh, interplanetary space, and they do various things of sort of creating coronal mass ejections to heating the plasma that makes it visible. And, um, and various bits like that. So here is a model uh, of a uh, source surface model from a recent paper by uh, a postdoc here. And um, here are some uh, observations from a recent paper by Antonio Savcheva, who's not here today, but has been a colleague of mine for working on lots of these things. And these are showing sort of the large scale structures in the corona, energy carrying structures. These are called sigmoidal active regions. So this is in the soft x-rays. Um, and it's an S-shaped structure, which is highlighted in the x-rays. So those are outlining the magnetic field structures. The photosphere is down below. And these things uh, can be modeled quite nicely with uh, 
forward modeled using a uh, magnetic field modeling that was developed by Ad van Ballen Hoy and myself uh, some 10 years ago, and we've been uh, hacking away at this for, for the better part of a decade. On the small scale stuff, of, so this is, sorry, this is another just showing you, you know, there's the active region that we were looking at before these things, so sort of the characteristic size of the sun and soft x rays. Um, and on the small scale side, right, you have hot loops that are generated within active regions. These are uh, observations of a raster scan from an instrument on Hinode, uh, an EUV spectrometer called ICE, and the various emission lines and their characteristic temperatures, showing there are bright loops, as hot loops as well as cool loops, and the loops are, are dynamic uh, in time. ICE doesn't give you the time evolution very well because it has to scan it, but you have a sense of that from, from the soft X-ray observations. So what do we do? with these plethora of observations, right? Um, so there are two types of active regions that, that one can imagine studying, right? There's one like these that are kind of large, rapidly emerging active regions. So this is a magnetogram from the uh, HMI. It's measuring, you know, positive and negative flux, positive and negative flux, emerging over the course of several days. And as, you know, the, t the date is down here, 17, 1217, 1218. So large time scales going on, but there's huge amounts of flux emerging, and the thing is kind of never in equilibrium, right? So these are X flares here, these are M flares, sort of decadal scale in uh, magnetic flux, in, uh, in X ray flux, in two different pass bands in the GOES satellite, right? So these things are really hard to model because what's going on is you've got fields that are erupting from underneath the surface of the sun that are carrying currents when they emerge, and you kind of don't see them very easily underneath the surface of the sun, so you really don't know what's going on before that happens, and then you're always trying to catch up. So it's kind of never in equilibrium. The things that we've been modeling and um, are, this is, a, again, one of these small sigmoidal active regions over the course of, again, several days, but it's evolving slowly. Uh, it's kind of always in quasi-static equilibrium in the sense that the magnetic structure changes slowly compared to the characteristic transit times of alphane speeds and things like that, which are thousands of seconds, you know, minutes or hours. And these things are evolving over days. And so what you can do with something like this is say, well, you know, I will build a sequence of models, magnetic field models, which are shown here, here, and here. These are the currents looking down from the top. These are the currents in cross-section, concentrating in those little boxes. Um, and I will compare, I will determine whether I have a magnetic field model that I like by comparing the field line structure with the actual outlines of the fields from the observations. So I create a sequence of forward models and then pick the one that fits the best. And we have systematic characteristic goodness of fit parameters. Now, if you do forward modeling, you have to always remind yourself that the model that I like is a representation of the observations. It is not the observations. It is not what the sun has done. It is something that is consistent with the observations. That's all I can ever tell you. So what I can do, though, is say, well, let's pretend that I actually believe that those magnetic fields are telling me something about the actual sun. What would that imply? Right? And so what I can do then is say, let's take a model that is nearly unstable, because our models are, are magnetostatic, but they are uh, evolved in a way that we can tell where the stability boundary is. And we can then explore the near instability of those models and compare them with actual instabilities that occur in the sun, which are flares. So here's a cartoon of the standard flare model. Right? Uh, these are sort of actual images associated with different bits of the flare. So just to orient you, here's the surface of the sun. These are flare ribbons. Foot, uh, these are foot points of a flux rope that is emerging, which, and this is the CME that goes out. This is the cusp here where the shock is that comes down. And these are the ribbons here and the loop top arch there, right? So over here, here's a coronagraph image. The disk of the sun is there. This is in white light. There's a CME going out. That's this bit. Here's a candle flame uh, arcade in the soft x-rays showing the hot loops 
that are just at the, we believe, at the area of the reconnection site there. And then here we're seeing these are transient coronal holes, so they're dark regions in the EUV at the foot points of these loops. They become dark because the material is leaving, the density drops tremendously, and then since the density goes as n, the emission goes as n squared, when the density drops, you don't have anything, and so you see these dark regions, characteristically telling you where the foot points are. And then you have the flare ribbons, which are these. These have been seen forever. You can see them sometimes in the visible, easily in the ultraviolet necromosphere. H alpha shows them beautifully. And then these are the classic uh, flare loops that happen as the uh, below the reconnection line. Right, so that's the standard 3D model of flares. And now we can take our magnetic field models and put them into here and see, can we associate topological structures in our magnetic field models with things like the flare ribbons? And in fact, the embarrassing thing is that you can, and, uh, and it's telling you something about how energy is stored uh, in magnetic fields in the corona. Um, so, here are examples of blow-ups of some of those models in different uh, um, different sigmoids. This is a whole series of different models that were observed, um, and what we uh, what we were able to show in the uh, in the analysis is that, and I haven't run the plots, but um, if you look at the uh, quasi-static quasi-separatrix layers, which are measuring essentially the topological measurement of how things are diverging in the uh, magnetic um, model. So if I have a null point, that would then, it, it would be a separator in, uh, in a potential field. If you have a non-potential field, your separators become quasi-separators because there's a continuous change in the field topology. And the structures, let me go back to uh, this. Uh, this guy. The structures that you see here, sort of these, um, uh, in the current structures, you, you know, it's a little bit hard. I didn't put the right plot. Um, if you pull out the, there's um, reconnection regions going on below <coughs> these uh, arc-like arc fl um, flux ropes, those predict where, as I erupt my, um, as I erupt my filament, the reconnection on these, the line of where those structures, this X line occurs, outlines where the, the filaments are, and that X line also is a topological structure that separates the connectivity of these points with the connectivities that go there and the overlying connectivities. And so we can identify in our magnetic field models the uh, high rapid change in connectivity as I go from here to here. This foot point is, this foot point is nearby. This foot point, the foot point on the other side is actually quite far away. And so there's a, these are a uh, quasi-separators, and those map out the flare ribbons. And that was done in this recent paper that's uh, coming out in 2016 um, with Antonio and myself. And so the point there is that by modeling with a fairly low-resolution magnetic field model where I'm inserting flux ropes into these models and relaxing them, I'm able to capture the structure of the flare ribbons in their um, topological characteristics. And so that's one of, the, one of the things that has us quite excited. And it then kind of forces you into saying, well, now I'm at a point where I'm looking at the physical processes that are allowing me to understand what becomes unstable when. And so giving you sort of a basis for how do I forecast flares based on physical instabilities rather than forecasting them based on kind of morphological structures, which is kind of where we are at this point. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about quickly was uh, this new um, field of called the transition corona. So this is an image, a processed image from the AIA telescopes that were built here. So we have one scaling uh, of the image on the disk, 
and above the limb there's a scaling that's we call a radial, a radial filtering. So essentially you, you're scaling it um, as a flat, uh, it is equally bright at all radii, the brightest feature at all radii has the same color because the density is falling off, otherwise you don't see very much at all. But when you do this, you know, it's suddenly it's, it's this sort of magical effect goes on. So it's evolving, you know, there's the time frame, days going by. Um, and there's evolution kind of everywhere on all scales. And things are opening up, things are closing down, um, things are just being dynamic and closed. There are structures uh, creating and forming. And it's complicated in the sense that this, this is only mapping out a particular temperature, about a million degrees. The 171 angstrom line in the UV is iron 9 and 10 in this passband. Um, but it's intriguing as to what all the, the dynamics that are going on. And there are things you can do with this. And one of the things our colleagues in France have done with us with this is studying these in, again, using these topological magnetic field models. So here's a sequence of images um, over the course of several hours. And what you notice here is these intricate structures. There are field lines, if you believe the plasma is tied to the magnetic fields. There are closed surfaces here and here. The surfaces that open out into interplanetary space. And then there are these very interesting and dynamic knot structures going on in between. So here, the only models you easily can do are potential field models, which are useful for gross topology, but they're not going to match the observations very well because the whole nature of seeing things that are have plasma in them mean, kind of means they're not potential to begin with, um, but it's the best you can do. So this is kind of showing you the large-scale topology. There are negative and positive potentials. Uh, so this is a potential field extrapolation out to 2.5 solar radii, in which point everything that reaches that becomes radial and goes out into interplanetary space. That's the source surface. And, you know, you can identify the various structures and then map them back onto the image plane. And, you know, and it's okay. It's, 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 it's not so great, but it's, it gives you at least a sense that you're, you're doing the right thing. But what's really actually interesting is that if you just do the magnetic field modeling in an idealized sense, there are structures in the, these are just computational models of a closed system with open field lines and a null point um, and currents in here. And now you do have these things that look, again, embarrassingly like the images where you have this bright structures, these are in currents. This is sort of current normalized by uh, magnetic field and all these plots in different times. You have uh, these fan structures, you've got the closed fields down below which are not heated in these things, there's no, no plasma on these, and the, outer, and the outer structures. And so the dynamics of the images are showing you the dynamics of the magnetic fields, and you can use sophisticated MHD modeling to understand how the magnetic fields evolve, and then map them back onto the images and see whether, you know, are you in the right ballpark or not. This is kind of not predictive, obviously, because we made this up, um, but, um, but we're, we're in, in kind of the right, the right frame, I believe. Um, and here's just a movie of this, uh, oops. On. Well, yeah, so there's the movie. Um, and it's kind of evolving slowly, but you can get a sense as to the, how things are changing in these regions, the closed field regions down here, and the material that is moving out from perhaps the reconnection region and opening up into interplanetary space. Um, so, a couple of problems. The third problem that I wanted to look at, this was done by a, a colleague of ours, um, uh, Bin Chen, here. And this is showing you the power of having multiple observations, multi-wavelength observations, including the radio, EUV, and soft x-rays, in studying something that's been a classic problem in, uh, in solar flares. 
of how you accelerate particles at shocks. People just believe this is the cartoon model. And this is what everybody believes has happened, but nobody really has ever observed it because it's really hard to see. Um, so you've got up here in your standard flare model is the reconnection site. Um, so there's a current sheet there. These uh, magnetic fields that have been reconnected are, are coming down, uh, blowing inwards. And then there is a termination shock there that, you get, that is observable, observed in the radio, where you have particle acceleration, you have hard X-ray loop top sources, and then you've got the EUV and soft X-ray sources down below the heated plasma. All right, so plasma is heated here, it goes down into the foot points, evaporation causes the, uh, the soft X-ray uh, and uh, EUV loops, and the hard X-ray uh, structures are locally heated plasma there. Um, there have been simulations that have been done as well as part of, in part of this paper um, by Cheng Tsai here. And, uh, and then these are the observations, and we'll show a, a movie from their science paper from this year. Um, yes. Oh, it's just five minutes. Thank you. Good. Um, so this is uh, the overview. Here's the limb of the sun. So it's a limb event. This is the... Uh, XRT images, so this is, there's a, a, a hot source up there. This is the box of interest, and they're combined uh, cool and, uh, and immediately hot AIA. The blow up of and rotation of that box is shown here, and now you, they've added the, uh, the VLA signature and the RESI two temperatures from RESI, the non thermal, and the, uh, and the thermal plasma. Uh, located in, in there, and then there's a, a smaller box. So in the uh, here's the time domain, and this kind of is important for. There's a lot of information here, so but you know, bear with me. Um, goes is just telling you the integrated flux and AIA integrated flux. This is demonstration that there is in fact a CME because we see something propagating outward in the Lasco C2. We can also track that into the hot plasma in the XRT, and it's really hard to see in the 94 angstrom passband. But uh, what you do see if you do these things called a running difference, because the sun is very time dependent, you can take differences of images and they actually show you something useful. You see these 150 kilometer per second inflows uh, coming into the loop tops. So bright stuff down here is the loop top. This is time, distance along the slice. And faint stuff up here is just be faint because it's n, 1 over n squared is, is, is killing you. Um, there are these cavities, or at least cool, either they're cool plasma or they're no plasma, maybe just magnetic field lines. But um, propagation down, and the green line here is showing you the height of this non-thermal emission. Right? And we're going to see a movie of that. These are blow-ups of the radio observations, and I'm not going to interpret them for you because I'll probably do it wrong. Anyway, radio people tell me these are signatures of uh, particle acceleration. I believe them. So, um, this movie, the dots, little dots here, are showing the uh, locations of the uh, energized electrons. The large circle is the locus of those inflowing one of those inflowing blobs. Here is the simulation that's showing a downflowed propagating disturbance. And what's happening is that when the inflowing blobs cross into this dense region of the top of the loop tops, they're disturbing the shock. So the shock breaks up. So this is particle acceleration at the shock. The shock dissipates. It turns out it then reforms, and it happens over and over again. And so this is really a very nice example of multi-wavelength, time-dependent observations combined with simulations that are showing you very complicated plasma and magnetohydrodynamic phenomenon. And it's kind of the best, the first best example, and hopefully we're going to have more of these observations. We've tried to schedule more of this uh, when he has VLA time this year. So that's very cool. But now on to, you know, hardware. Right, funded hardware, we have solar probe on sweep. Um, there are the instruments being built here are uh, the only instruments on this, this. This is going into 
10 solar radii are very hot. Here's the front shield that uh, keeps the rest of the instruments from melting. Here's our instrument that's peeking out over the top because it actually has to see the solar wind ions and plasma, ions and electrons. And so, you know, one might imagine that that's a fairly challenging piece of technology to build. Uh, there's a picture of it. And uh, the uh, uh, co colleagues at Berkeley are building uh, other plasma instruments that are looking at uh, behind and ahead uh, ions and electrons. Um, and so this is an in situ observations of solar wind plasma in uh, just in the acceleration region of the solar wind down below 10 solar radii. Um, PIMS is a new uh, program that, that was won. And um, I call it, you know, it's our sort of contribution to the Europa fish finder. The idea is, you know, are you going to find liquid water and that can sustain life? Will you actually see squid? Who knows? But this guy is actually there to measure the plasma fields so that you can actually do the magnetic sounding that's going to identify the squid swimming around in the water. Right? So, the, so you kind of have to do the plasma measurements in order to get the magnetic field measurements. And, uh, and that's the SAO contribution to this. And this is actually really very fun. Um, high sea reef light. This is a rocket. Uh, the highest resolution images of the solar corona that were ever taken were from the first high sea rocket. The second high sea rocket is going to be in a uh, hotter, uh, cooler passband um, to look at sort of cooler material associated with with the ICE instrument, uh, has much greater throughput than AIA. And uh, there were, what, Leon, 17 odd publications out of the first rocket? 20? Something like that. It was very, very, it produced a data set that lots of people found useful. I and mean, they weren't all written out of here. I mean, the data was publicly available shortly after the launch, after it was calibrated. And, uh, and a variety of people did a variety of different things uh, with that very quickly. Um, so hopefully that will be a, equally successful. Um, this is something that's, that's new. This is an NSF-funded instrument. Um, and it's, uh, it's very new for us because we're sort of venturing into the infrared for the first time um, and spectroscopy as opposed to just imaging. Um, so what we have proposed and wanted is an infrared mid-IR a uh, spectrograph that will fly on uh, NCAR G5 aircraft during the 2017 solar eclipse, which is crossing the United States. You should all watch it at some point in the United States, August 21st. Um, and so the telescope is fairly small, fairly modest telescope. It had, there's a slit, there's going to be a slit jar camera so you can see where your slit is in, in the corona and various bits of gratings and, uh, Pull bears there. The uh, infrared lines that are going to be hopefully observed uh, are shown here. Silicon, sulfur, iron, magnesium, and another silicon line. And, uh, and this is showing you the length of the slit and possible locations of the slit. The idea is to identify these lines and their strengths in the corona because they've really never been observed except for this guy, I believe. Um, and they're all magnetically sensitive lines. So if you can demonstrate that the lines exist in, in sufficient strength in interesting parts of the corona, you can then go back and build yourself a spectral polarimeter and measure the magnetic fields kind of directly in the corona. And measuring the magnetic fields directly in the corona is something that lots and lots of people want to do. DKIST has a, one of its driving requirements. DKIST is the four meter solar telescope that's going into Hawaii. Um, uh, to measure magnetic fields in the white, in the sort of infrared corona, really just above the, the sun, but in the corona itself. And it's, it's driving, it drove a lot of the DKIS design. It drove the site selection that you had to be coronagraphic site. Um, and, uh, and so the question is, uh, what are these strengths? Are these lines, um, something that you might want to build a balloon to observe later on? Uh, things like that. So we're very excited about that as well. And I'm late. I'm sorry. <sighs> okay. Hi. So in an early slide, you had T Max.
Act 6.4, 6.8, is that log T? Yes. Uh, and I wanted to ask, what is the current state of the art in imaging the sun, the active sun, at say 1 keV in terms of imaging quality? Um, XRT is the best uh, telescope up there. It's got one arc second pixels. Um, and yeah, so, so we, we have, we have that, uh, that is the, the, the best for a uh, grazing incidence telescope. Yes? Would you care to comment on Solar C's? Uh, <laughs> oh, I put it in there. It's Solar C is, is an interesting character. It's a, it's the follow on to Hinode, which we, which was very successful, is up and is very successful. It's been, bandied about for half a decade or more. Um, and the timing is never right. You know, so the Japanese were waiting for the U.S. to do something. This is this being recorded? <laughs> we'll talk about solar sea later, but it, it may still exist. I mean, so um, because, you know, administrations changed. I mean, part of the problem was the heliophysics division has gone through kind of a sequence of temporary and interim and non, you know, and, and no more direct overturn of directors, like four of them in the last five years. And so if you don't have any leadership at NASA, you kind of don't have any person to argue for your budgets. And so you're not really going to be doing anything new because the other people aren't out of the generosity of their hearts going to say, well, heliophysics really needs more money. So, you know, astrophysics will just take a step back on our program. It kind of doesn't really happen that way. So, um, so I think, you know, there's been issues all over the place on solar sea. Maybe it'll happen in our lifetime. Yes? Question. Since you've been using the XRT, presumably from a uh, mid-X mission, have you considered using the pack to get some hard X-ray imaging, as crude as it might be? Uh, RESI provi has, is providing, RESI still exists, so we have a, a harder X-ray imaging uh, satellite that's, uh, in fact, there are resi observations in that, um, the, the, uh, the contours of the hard x-ray uh, in the uh, discussion about the in plasma uh, shock acceleration were from resi. So, um, but... If you look at that, it might be more sensitive. More sensitive to... Uh, than resi. Oh, yeah. But they do they look at the sun? I mean, New Star looks at the sun. We've got new, new stars. I mean, they, they, look, they kind of look at the sun when nothing's happening on the sun. And one of our examples of how badly we predict solar flares is they actually scheduled a new star set of observations um, when we expected nothing ha was happening on the sun and there was an X flare, right? I mean, you didn't even just get it wrong. It wasn't like there was just a flare. There was like a very large and dramatic flare. And it's like, it, so we, it's kind of, yeah. But uh, haven't, don't know about Compton. Yeah, not sure. I'm sorry. If you're getting data from uh, the XRT on SWIFT, Match there. Oh, time. oh, no, I'm sorry. RXRT is a different XRT. Uh, RXRT is on Hino Day. Oh, okay. It's the, uh, you know. the high resolution, sorry, the ac it's an acronym failure. Okay. <laughs> sorry.